<laughs> so um, hello, knowing me, knowing you. Aha. Uh, in, in real life, I spent 18 years working in the pharmaceutical industry uh, for the Wellcome Foundation, the only philanthropic pharmaceutical company, in my humble opinion. I used to work on things like human insulin uh, and the first HIV AIDS drug. So I had a background in science. Uh, I also, in parallel, started tutoring MBA courses many, many years ago, about 18 odd years, uh, both tutoring them and writing them. So I've sort of um, got a sort of business uh, skill. And I've been, uh, uh, I left my job in pharma uh, 30 years ago and have run my own business um, as a consultant and author over 30 odd years. And that does two things. It does long-term organization development for companies that have lost the power of reason, which increases as, as companies get big, bigger, I find. You could draw a graph with size and and um, sort of uh, difficulty in understanding complicated issues because com big companies are very much more complicated than small ones. And I've written 14 books on business and uh, had an interview with Richard Branson in one and other things like that. Uh, I have this specialism, therefore, uh, because I'm also a musician of synthesizing business lessons, uh, MBA type business lessons with parallel insights from music. So that's my mainstream life. Uh, however, around the 24th of June, 2016, I decided to set aside all of that quite a, quite a long success, actually. Uh, I was doing quite nicely, thank you, until Brexit happened. And I decided to set that aside in order to do full-time sort of anti-Brexit work and pro-EU work. I'm sort of setting it aside at the moment because I've, be I've got to the point of thinking that uh, people have really gone asleep on this issue. So the, the, the people that are here tonight are the exception that proves the rule, actually. Um, so I call myself the Brexit in chief, having written three books on Brexit. Uh, I shall be talking about one of them tonight and a little bit about another. Um, also, uh, six albums of anti-Brexit tunes. Some of them are dreadful. Some of them are quite good, though. Um, I had 400 odd videos. So I, I've been a busy person since uh, 2016. So one could say that Brexit is keeping me alive. Although, of course, it will be the death of all of us. Anyway, that's me. Um, so this slide deck is is a bit old or it has 2022 on it. But I, I'm going to update it verbally. I did do some updating this morning because my Mac died this morning. So I couldn't get uh, you know, the, the new slide deck off. But actually, it's surprisingly not that different. So it's becoming increasingly apparent to all of the world in Britain and the world outside that Brexit is broken. 63% um, of the last count of people believe it's broken. But as I just mentioned, Brexit apathy, apart from people sitting on this uh, seminar, is at an all time high. People don't believe there's anything much they can do about it. Um, and, you know, we've been bludgeoned to death by all the political parties. I'm not especially political in any, I'm not a party member of anything particularly, but they've all decided not to talk about Brexit. Um, but the children of Brexit, the, the byproducts, the sort of offspring of Brexit are completely all the subjects that we'll, we'll have a general election about. So if we're talking about root causes, Brexit is the root of many of the problems that we're now uh, part of our lived experience uh, towards the general election. Um, so we can't let Britain forget about Brexit is one of the points I made. I did an interview with Jonty Bloom a little while ago in uh, for the European movement in Brighton, and I told the panel and the audience that I was a Brexit fundamentalist. That doesn't mean to say I live in a cave. It does mean that I, I believe the only good Brexit is a is a, you know, a dead Brexit and sort of mealy mouth accommodations um, ignore the fact that time is a major problem with the the you know, Brexit chaos and the Brexit carnage that takes place. And there will come a point, and I think we're quite close to that point, whereby there's so much damage done by Brexit that it won't be possible to undo it. In my chemical world as a chemist, I liken this to irreversible reactions, you, you know, like companies leaving the country aren't going to just suddenly wander back because if we if we decide to you know, alter Brexit. Um, and of course, by 2032, when Labour think they're going to do something about it, nobody will remember what Brexit is and the ability to assign any causation and correlation will become much more difficult over time because there'll all be there'll be a miasma of other effects uh, coming in here. But I do believe that joining a new or rejoining 
can happen, uh, but it it won't be easy. On the other hand, I do a little bit of work for Gina Miller, and she and I agree that if we simply said we had plans to rejoin, then that would make uh, instant economic benefits to the country because markets and economics are perfect. So if if there was intent to rejoin, uh, possibly there'd be some adjustment of the pound, maybe that ship has sailed. But things like the car industry saying they would leave the country would stop in an instant because rules of origin, et cetera, would no longer apply. So some of the carnage would stop instantly. So it doesn't matter how long it takes to rejoin. People focus on when we would rejoin. The important thing is when we declare that we want to, uh, at the beginning of the process rather than the end of the process. But I also believe this won't happen passively. Um, you know, It is in the hands of politics uh, totally, but if people don't apply pressure to politicians, they won't act uh, just on their own because they'd rather forget about Brexit. So I believe we must act collectively and cohesively. I also, the reason I put my full-time effort into it is volunteerism is fine, but of course you get that little 5%, 2% ex, uh, extra effort from people when they have it. And I think Nigel Farage knew this when he had a full-time organisation to uh, you know, get Brexit done. So I do believe that we need a, a proper organisation, but I, I'll come on to organisation later. I think our structure of our organisation is a little like Indonesia, 17,000 tiny islands, all individuals uh, doing their very best and one or two larger organisations. and But that isn't really enough, I don't believe. So I don't believe we're fully match fit for this because Rejoin does need leadership. It needs strategy, focus and power. That's the sort of big view of, of things. I am gonna. I might mention David Cameron later on. Don't Please don't sort of attack me over the airways for doing that. But I do believe, against the odds, that David Cameron is a, an asset. That doesn't mean to say I'm forgiving him for everything he's done. But he, I did meet with a, an MP in Parliament last week who was very excited about the arrival of Cameron. We have yet to see what he'll do. Um, but nonetheless, I, I, uh, I, most of the people I've talked to see him as a... Uh, they can't get past the, um, the pigs. But I believe we must get past the pigs. So what do we do in Rejoin Britain, uh, Reboot Britain even? <laughs> Gavin, um, there are five things we practice consistently through network meetings and various other forms of activism. And I think, you know, we're starting to get some traction on some of these. And they, re they relate to different market segments, as it were. The politicians, the 650 or so politicians and, and sort of bigger actors in the po political world, the mainstream media and social media, and then down at individuals and group level, and our major talk this afternoon will be about what we can do individually. But at the top line, uh, breaking the parliamentary paralysis. And this is why I think David Cameron is important. And, you know, lobbying politicians across party by all means, from letters, you know, shouting at them, um, whatever we do. Uh, we all do different things and they're all fantastic. But we need to get some great attraction on the... Uh, on the individual things that each island does to to make them stick a bit better. Um, so David Cameron, if he moves, if he so much as goes to Brussels and says, I've apologised to uh, yeah, Macron or something, and I, I we've had some early conversations about some areas where we could start to think about improvement. If he just, in a mealy-mouthed way, start to hint about rejoin, Keir Starmer would have to move in lockstep. So suddenly that bubble of parliamentary paralysis would paralysis would be stopped in one instant. Cameron doesn't have to execute the strategy. He just has to breathe over Brexit a couple of times. Uh, we, we, de we don't yet know what he will do, as I said, but there's an article on, on my website, brexitrage.com forward slash Cameron. It's a long read and you might not agree with all of it, but I say it is informed by conversations inside parliament uh, that the centre ground believes it's returning um some some people not, might not welcome that of course if you're political uh but i don't think there's no way that conservatives are going to win an election it's just a case of how badly they lose at the moment but i think rishi is desperate and that does probably explain why cameron has arrived 
Um, the second one is we need to make a bigger footprint on mainstream media. So I, I encourage people to get on the radio, to get on James O'Brien, to get on Radio 4, to do anything, get in the, you know, the right write letters, write articles if possible. And we have done most of that over the five or six years been doing this. Um, you know, just just to put a bigger footprint on mainstream media. So that the I liken media for people that sort of um you know get get up in the morning uh, uh, as being their breakfast. You know, and they are literally eating the wrong breakfast if they're reading the Daily Mail, the Express and the Sun. So we need to change their diet is one thing about you know, taking back control. And the same applies in number three on social media. And most of us do social media. That again, I don't I I don't consider our impact is as great on social media as it could be in mainstream media, but nonetheless we can all have access to it. So we have anti Brexit virus groups in some of the on some of the social media to try and multiply people's impact. And fourthly, and this is what we'll spend most of our time on and where we can have questions is working on this question of Brexorcism or what I mean by changing minds gently on Brexit one to one or possibly one to many via you know cafes, pubs, bars, bus stops, saunas. The sauna is the best place to change someone's mind on Brexit one to one. I've noted over time empirically, I don't have academic proof of this, that semi-naked men are less likely to punch you if you uh, start to talk to them about things they don't want to hear in a sauna. Um, but please, please uh, say that you found a better place because it's by no means the, the only place to do it. But, you know, doing this everywhere on a daily basis, moving the dial from 63% of people who believe that Brexit is a mistake to 70%. When we reach 70%, um, politicians probably have to take note of that because they'd, they'd rather not listen to it. So when it becomes incontrovertible that Brexit's a mistake, um, that means votes. And fifthly, and we work with other people on this particular objective, uh, it's not enough to fix ourselves. If we don't sort of gently move the relationship along with the EU, then we could do all this wonderful work from one to four and find that they say, well, we're not that interested in you rejoining. I have, however, met with Barnier and various other actors, and Gina Miller confirms that they would allow us to join. Uh, people say, oh, there's a legal process. But the, the major block to rejoining is now politics, and politics does just what it wants. And then the law catches up later on if necessary, as we well know with recent events. Right, moving on. We can do we can rejoin in many ways. I'm not a great fan of a referendum, but it is here. I pay my taxes for politicians to to deal with wicked problems uh, and not to give you know, give me the decision. So of course, we could see, you know that perhaps in a year or so's time, who knows whether Cameron starts talking about single market customs union or or whether Starmer does the same. Who knows uh, if he gets in power? Um, I'll have more to say about Labour and that uh, through conversations I've had with senior Labour people if, if we want to later on. Um, but there is this sort of logical incrementalism approach, doing it step by step, the sort of approach put forward by Andrew Adonis and, and co. There are problems with that because, you know, by the time you get to the end of it, uh, you, there might be nothing left to save. So I, I'm, I'm not a favor, in favour of slow change. But nonetheless, I am in favour of Parliament doing their damn job and saying, look, we've come to the conclusion that 70% of people find Brexit intolerable. What are we going to do about it? We could have a general election where Brexit becomes an issue. Unlikely to happen, I don't think. Uh, I wrote this a year or so ago. All the research from the UK and a changing Europe says and Anna Menon, who I know, says that nobody wants to talk about Brexit. He fails to mention, there's a very good article, which strangely I wrote about this, that points out that all the offspring of Brexit will be election issues. And if anyone really wants to talk about long-term solutions to, you know, current problems or you know, dealing with causes rather than uh, symptoms, because uh, all the parties are talking about this, Brexit is a cause of much of our lived experience currently through you know the nhs the cost of living and other things it's not the only cause but it is a cause so if they really want to talk about that i don't think brexit will go away but it's it's we're now talking about its offspring 
really in the general election. I, I did. I've got a slide later on that sort of helps to explain that. Or no, I don't because I haven't got it in this deck, but I have a Brexit iceberg that explains that. You'll find it on the website. Um, yes, we could have another referendum. Holy, holy something or other. We could have another referendum. Um, I'm I'm not bothered about having another ed, a referendum. I'd, I'd rather see it as a christening service for number one or two rather than another, because uh, people don't want to go through those family arguments again and all the, the stuff that went with it. Uh, suffice to say, um, if we don't have those, you know, that discussion again, this generation, which includes me, will be blighted for the next 20 years where Sunday teas will never be the same again. So, you know, lancing the boil of Brexit actually via a referendum might be the thing that brings the country together. But I'm, it's not my number one choice, I'll be honest. And fourthly, and I'm not advocating this because someone read it before and said, oh, you want to riot? I, I said, no, it just might happen. I, I, part of me is as a cold analyst. So, you know, eventually people might get fed up with the, with their lived experience, not with Brexit. And we have seen a, a real upswing in sort of unrest and what have you, and, and the general dissatisfaction with the state of our democracy. But I really must say on the video, just in case anyone uh, only hears the first part, I'm not encouraging riots <laughs> so there we have it um and of course the precondition of, of being able to get brexit done i wrote this in 2022 and in 2021 before it's been updated several times was getting rid of the brexit culture carriers and actually we have made tremendous progress on that nadine doris is gone jacob reese mogg looks like he'll lose his seat rishi sunak today looks like he might lose his seat although he's not perhaps the worst um member of the culture carriers but the erg essentially um so we need to make sure that those people lose power if they lose soft hard power via seats they lose soft power and i do think that rishi sunak's appointment of cameron is a is informed by his belief that the soft power of the erg is in recession now to the second part and the last part of my talk and then we can open it up i wrote a book i wrote several books actually I wrote a book called Reboot Britain. I don't know if you can see it, probably not. Um, and I wrote another book on Brexit satire. And this is more or less, I can, you know, I'm going to read you the book in you know, five minutes or so to save you reading it. There's still a couple of copies left. I've got a couple of copies left. Do not buy them on Amazon uh, because Amazon don't pay me hardly anything for them. And they charge ridiculous amounts, particularly for the satire book, which is in colour. Uh, if anyone wants one, they can get one off of me. Uh, anyway, the gentle art of Brexitism. This is not an accurate model. Uh, there wouldn't be enough room to put all the conditions on the Brexit brain here. But, you know, if you opened up the Brexiteer's brain, you'd find variously some or all of these things and other things as well. The idea of having British laws, British jobs, straight bananas, looking after number one, no garlic in the country. I'll come to that point later on. A um, bit of immigration, uh, you know, confusion, you know, selfishness, uh, the flag, the queen, the pound, and Cameron. <laughs> Cameron turns up even there. Um, what, therefore, is Brexitism? I can tell you what it isn't. It's not named after the film where your head swivels round uh, 360 degrees and we don't even need to swivel our heads 360 degrees we need to turn people's minds to the point that they think that brexit they don't need to become campaigners against brexit they just need to think oh it was a mistake which is 180 degree brexitism i discussed that in the book so Yeah, see, we don't need that kind of thing going on in this seminar. What is Brexitism then? Um, it's actually a blend of psychology, sociology, anthropology and therapy. I, I've blended these things from my professional life into a book that sort of uh, aimed to educate people on how to have difficult conversations with people who don't want to listen to you. And I do these in the sauna regularly. I've found it's my best place to to work on these people. And I have had quite a few successes. Um, so the, the, the original 
phrase was coined in the new European some years ago, but below it, I say, and I'll read it out in case you're on a phone that it changing minds, it requires quite a lot of skill, extreme levels of patience, which many of us, if we're honest, I've had people saying, I don't have any patience with Brexiteers. Well, that's why we haven't succeeded and shouting at them uh, at a march is not enough because it's a, you know, it's a silly transaction. We shout what we want. They shout back what they want. There is no mind change going on in that, in that conversation. It requires a lot of time, empathy, unconditional positive regard, which, or UPR if you're a counsellor. Um, so this is like where you might not agree with what they're saying to you, but you do believe it's the best they can do at the time. Uh, so you hold them in unconditional positive regard and time a great deal of time not necessarily in one session sometimes spread out over time and we can't just do it at a street stall or shouting people at a march it needs a relationship to tell people appalling things you need a stronger bank balance to tell someone that they're wrong than you would otherwise do uh, you know so you really must emphasize the, the, the relationship if you're going to actually explain anything that's difficult for people to hear uh, I find so what's on offer in the book I've said this it's a heady cocktail of all those things psychology linguistics sociology it borrows from the field of well several fields of psychology including neuro-linguistic programming that's the art of using language and body language and other things to enter other people's heads and sort of help them uh, persuade themselves that they might be wrong because the best change happens from within so people have told me oh I've tried facts well try a little uh, empathy first because you know NLP suggests you need lots of rapport if you're going to actually change anyone's minds and NLP has its critics as well including me it, it can be uh, misused but there are tools inside the, the discipline that are actually quite useful when, when nothing else works. But it isn't just psychology. It's it's about the sort of how groups work, sociology, and how tribes work, and how you change people who are stuck. So therapy is really part of this. And I discovered by accident Radio for Four had a program on how they were changing minds in elections in the States. And they were saying there's really slow methods of change uh, working on people over time on a doorstep they had a sp very special name for it but it was exactly what's in this book um, so there is some sort of validation of the book from other places actually um, and I've practiced over thousands of hours um, and got lots of things wrong many things right and you can do it any way you want um, yeah so find your protege or victim if you prefer to call them that but don't call them victims in real life of course <laughs> <laughs> um so the same strategies really that paul mckenna used to help vote leave use the referendum although they focus really on language and getting catchy slogans that's where my musician thing comes in you we have to we have to find we have to better vote leave at what they do so we do have to have catchy slogans but our difference is being able to validate them, evidence them and explain the slogans so that they're not vacuous, you know, take back control or, you know, build a wall or whatever it is. So McKenna focused on giving them, you know, headlines for pop songs, uh, but they were vacuous. Our difference must be to have the headlines that stick in people's minds, but to help them then understand that they are whole and they have meaning. And this is why I've been working with Gina Miller at the moment. So also the other thing is there are different styles in terms of Brexorcism. And this is from therapy from a, a really good writer called John Heron, which I focus on a lot in the book. And there are basically two sorts of things you can have in a conversation. You can tell people things and you, and you can direct them, in other words, or you can be non-directive. Counselors know this very well. The stuff at the top, you know, take these pills and you'll feel better. I'm letting you know that what, you know, that 10% of people disagree with you, that's informing, or quite simply you're wrong, that's confronting. And you can have longer versions of all of these. I'm just giving you some examples. All of those things are tremendously quick because you can tell them to take the pills. Doctors do this. And if you trust the doctor, you will take the pills. Um, 
But if you're trying to change people's mind, it is the ones at the bottom that tend to be more effective. And they're sort of more or less like Socratic questioning skills of saying, I see this is the, the best answer you can give me at the moment about Brexit. That's supporting getting people to get things off their chest, which is why it takes a long time. They have to tell you their story or catalyzing new ideas amongst them. And all of this is you know, developed in detail in the book. I'm happy to send you some some you know, screenshots of some of the more important pages from that. Um, so people think that we must tell them that does work. And I do use it when I've got enough report, I can actually say to some people, well, you're quite wrong about the bananas. Let me explain why. Uh, but you can't confront people usually at the beginning of a conversation until you have done some of the other things. So this is why it's a slow process and you can do it anywhere. You know, um, here's some of the things I've, uh, confronted over time uh i spent an hour and a half with a man in the pub and we worked through all of his all of his objections and then he said i said have you anything left and he said yes i don't like garlic and he voted for brexit because of that so it becomes quite difficult but by then i was able to sort of you know confront him and say well what do you mean and what he didn't like was lots of uh, shops uh, that were selling kebabs in the town centre and I said, well, that's got nothing to do with Brexit, has it? And you'd realise they grow garlic in this country. And he had to agree with me. But my goodness, that took a long time. Uh, sometimes the uh, Brexitism it isn't a, you know, a smooth and clean process. I'm sorry about this slide, because it is a real letter that I was sent by an ex-metropolitan uh, policeman who lives around the corner from me. He took exception to my dustbin pictured on the, on the left-hand side here or possibly the right-hand side, depending on how you're viewing it. Uh, my dustbin is covered in stickers and other things. The house is also decorated. And this horrible letter arrived. Uh, then he started, he said, if, you, if I didn't mend my ways, I would regret it. And then he started um, uh, spray painting my house. And eventually he um, came around with a knife and... Um, I went to the police. Of course, they weren't very interested because he was he was ex metropolitan police. Uh, so I took him to court, and three and a half thousand pounds later, I um I nailed him for the damage he'd done, and he still said he wasn't a metropolitan police officer, officer despite being on LinkedIn. Uh, he still said he didn't use a knife, despite me showing him the knife. Here is the video. Uh, I can get there. So there is a hilarious um, negotiation with our Ken uh, in the book, which goes on for about 15 pages, because two weeks before uh, I took him to court, he he capitulated and wanted to, um, to, yeah, to make a deal. And it was rather like it was a textbook negotiation, rather like Michel Barnier, because uh, I never actually took him to court in the end. But that's a much longer story. Um, OK, so uh, sometimes uh, people say, well, isn't it frightening to deal with some of these idiots? Well, yes, but this is the exception that proves the rule. And if it, I go around every day, you know, with a target painted on my back, not literally, but, you know, my house is covered in stickers. So if you do this all the time, someone will get angry. But he really is the exception and he has some health problems. Uh, put it, Let's put it that way um he's he was very angry about being kicked out of the met um for i don't know quite know the reasons but he he's transferred that anger to brexit uh in a long story short moving towards the end um there's tons of th resources in the book of how do you answer people when they say things like they need them we need them more than they need us we can have our cake and eat it too and they're going to tell us what sort of toilet roll we can eat. And this is, I'm afraid this one at the bottom is from my sister, who's 80. Um, I stopped having her around for tea in 2017 after she told me that she didn't want Sharia law on Tunbridge High Street. 
and there were two million what, what rapists waiting to come uh, to, to Tunbridge from Berlin. I told her I was, it made me quite depressed to listen to this kind of stuff. She got it straight out of the Daily Mail, of course. And um, thinking that she would feel sorry for me, but because she is a rampant Tory, she actually went on the attack and said, well, Peter, um, if I don't see you, I'm 80, I'm nearly 80 now. And if I don't see you, I, I will die soon. And then you're going to be very sorry you didn't see me which did persuade me that it was best to have a kind of cold war for a couple of years. So I haven't quite forgiven her yet, but she's quite disappointed because I, I uh, she really does believe that somehow it would be a shame. Um, and I'm sure lots of us have had these sort of difficult encounters. My one regret is I didn't persuade my sister. And actually, I think there's probably a graph we could draw here. The closer you are to the person you're trying to persuade, the more difficult it is. So friends and family are much more difficult than strangers, oddly enough. You'd think it would be the other way around, but I think a lot of people will agree that you know, family, particularly as she's the older sister and thinks that she knows more than I do and all the rest of it, difficult. Uh, also in the book, 170 Brexit freedoms. There they all are. Bags of hot air. Um yeah, the 350 EU freedoms that we had, that is the love we lost. Um, Paul Cawthorn did a superb job and helped me to, yeah, you know, by providing this list, he's an economist. And it goes through in different groups, all the reasons, all the things we've now lost, of course. And of course, these would be the things that we could talk about as reasons to rejoin. Because uh, if we don't have a positive case, which we didn't under Cameron, he, he took it all to... Uh, he thought it was going to be so easy. He didn't factor Nigel Farage's weaponization of austerity into the equation, and he was caught napping, really. Um, so we would have to have a, a good case going forward rather than just saying Brexit's a mess. We need both sides of that curve. Then, you know, what's wrong with Brexit? But more importantly, what's right with the EU for maximum leverage or leverage, as they say in the States? And I think we're done, nearly. Uh, Hang on. Yeah, I have another book called Private Airlines, which takes the media on at their own game, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, that's a really good present for, for Brexiteers in regret because they'll laugh while they are Brexicised. Uh, and so it exaggerates the ridiculous headlines of the populist media. So we have The Daily Excess, uh, The Son, um, The Daily Mall, The Railway, Railway Meddler even. And it's time for questions and answers, and I've done more than enough. And thank you for putting up with an old slide deck.